So both the structural and non-structural mitigation process is very, very important when it comes in terms of understanding the process altogether of disaster risk reduction. We will need to improve our eco-space dimension. So what we mean by that early warnings is that we are trying to provide you measures or alternative pathways through which you will be able to mitigate the risk. Good morning and welcome to the second session of disaster management and we have been talking about this topic called as disaster risk reduction that was our previous topic in this topic we are going to talk about structural and non-structural measures in terms of reducing the disaster so quickly moving forward try to understand what is the structural and non-structural now, when I talk about structural mitigation, it is the physical changes or act of protection from disaster or hazards. For example, it might be when a family reinforces of making of a home, whether more windproof or earthquake proof. Let's try to understand this in detail. Now, normally when you are going to build a house or you are going to construct a bridge or a dam, what will be the thought process in your mind is that you want to build a system which is fail safe proof. You want to go in a providing manner, you want to go in such a manner that the structural mitigation should have the maximum safety as far as possible. So wherever you are, whether it be your work area or your home, or it is going to be a leisure area, but still you want that building, you want that area to be as secured as possible. So what we mean by structural mitigation is that the physical changes or the act of protection from disasters and hazards. So any kind of disasters or hazards that impact on the building, that will definitely have a long lasting effect altogether. So these days, if you start looking, people ask for buildings which are earthquake resistant, which are the, you know, dependent away from any kind of factors which are independent to this cyclone or tsunami or any kind of effects. They look even for paints which are antimicrobial. They look for paints which are, you know, weather shield, weather bond and all those factors so that their house does not get damaged altogether. So that is one of the reasons if I have to just quote an example, Nippon paint started coming up with weather shield, weather bond kind of paint which could prevent the houses from extreme heat condition, extreme rain conditions and other factors. So when we talk about structural mitigation, we need to keep in mind all the physical impact that could probably happen on a building or an infrastructure. Now, non-structural mitigation in emergency management involves what people could do on a personal level that is not structurally or physically evidenced as protective defense such as a surge wall or a storm shelter altogether. Now, in a non-structural manner, mobile, I start switching towards the non-structural factor. It talks about people as in how they can react, how they can manage even when that is not structurally well developed or it is not available there. Now many a times in India, though we keep talking about infrastructure, we do keep talking about the buildings, the institutions, the far-fetched research areas, the factors all together, but then we come back and somehow we start feeling contented or rather we start feeling about this factor that how things are going to happen this way, why things are not being really structured enough for us. So in that factor, in that manner, we need to understand that there are times when people will not have that physical structure for protection. But yes, they need to have a non-structural format. They need to have something that can actually create a shield, that can actually create a preventive fold altogether. So both the structural and non-structural mitigation process is very, very important when it comes in terms of understanding the process altogether of disaster risk reduction. 
Now, let's look into the structural procedure altogether. Structural mitigation would be when a family reinforces that the home to make it more windproof or earthquake proof. That means to say that the family or the section of people living there want to make their area more secure. So they believe that at any given conditions, whatever might be the situation, they want the area, the building, the physical structure to be as strong as possible. Followed by other structural mitigation examples would be like creating a sandbag barrier around the home when a flight, flood might occur or you are trying to put a shield or you are trying to put a mesh, something like that which would be able to stand as a physical structure not trying to allow the disaster to have a direct impact on you. Now, this is one of the reasons where you will see that most of the high rises building in countries like Singapore or Hong Kong are also subjected to big disasters as far as possible. Now, of course, those buildings have been constructed with the modern technologies. Those buildings have been constructed by keeping in mind the different kinds of reinforcements altogether. But still, what happens here is that most of the time, the structural factors majorly depend upon how quick are we in terms of creating those preventive infrastructure, how quick are we in creating those buildings or those factors in such a manner so that the entire building always remains protected for us. In general, I would say structural mitigation is the direct action that takes place around building or movement in order to preserve their life and their property. So now this is where you need to understand the equal importance that is given to life as well as property. So it's a very, very important combination or aspect. Why? Because as human beings, we always feel that the amount of effort, money, energy, time that has gone inside in creating a physical asset or in creating a physical property has been always very precious to us. Sometimes we feel that our home is even more important than our life. And that's a psychological factor that you need to understand within yourself. So what we understand here is that our life and property are equally important. You cannot give up. Though we say that, you know, life of a human being is very precious, but still the shelter is equally precious. It's equally important. So we need to spend some time. We need to spend some energy in terms of understanding the entire scenario. So that is why I would say that the structural mitigation is the direct action that people take, build or move in order to preserve the life and property of altogether. So that is why it is very, very important here for all of us to understand. Now, moving forward, the structural mitigation would also happen like this when we talk about construction of tsunami walls, the river gates, the tsunami forest altogether. Well, what are these things? Now, I was trying to convert this or connect with you in terms of tsunami, taking that as a natural disaster altogether. Now, in the Asian countries which experienced tsunami some time back, they understood that the one way to prevent tsunami is to start building those high-rise walls which could probably stand as a barricade against those giant waves entering into the city. Now, those high-rise walls are something which are of really very great height, like about 100 feet, 200 feet tall walls which are strong enough so that they stand as a fortress in the front of the city and try to block that water coming inside. So construction of tsunami walls was considered to be one of the preventive measures through which you can stop or you can prevent those giant waves harming you. The next one is that the river gates. Now most of the time in India, moment the water is being allowed to flow out of a dam, out of a system, the villages surrounding that dam or the nearby area completely gets flooded. Which means to say that the water gushes through the entire system in such a manner that there is no preventive barricade at all. 
and this actually leads to the damage of crops which have been put there all the crops get completely damaged and the farmers are again affected so what we have decided or what we have thought in terms of the government is that to build on river gates so that when the flash floods occur or when the sudden release of water from the dam is being done there is some preventive gate that tries to stop the excess of water flowing into this system tsunami forest basically what we understand is that creation of dense forest space which means to say creation of more and more greeneries with taller trees with lot of uh, you know greener environment all together plants and trees put together will try to arrest the flow of water inside to the city so which means to say that we want to build a greener eco space surrounding the walls of the city which means that is very very important that we emphasize to the people we emphasize to the citizens of that state of that district very very clearly stating that we will need to improve our eco space dimension we need to spend time in terms of making them understand the need and importance in terms of the forestry or the forest development because what has happened these days is that as man has started expanding his livelihood has he has started expanding the city where he was living now most of the bigger cities in india now for example let's take bangalore itself bangalore earlier was only a small city in the country but today bangalore has got greater bangalore it has got lesser bangalore area it has got a rural bangalore it has got an urban city so you know the city has been expanding so much in order to accommodate that floating population that on and off we have been constantly damaging the ecosystem surrounding the city so today if you go across bangalore city you will start seeing more of high rise buildings and concrete structures rather than those big tall green trees so somewhere down the lane of course bangalore is not subjected to tsunami at any given point of time because it is not quite close to the coastal area but if you start understanding the scenario here very very clearly for cities like chennai cities like mangalore which are very very closer towards the coastal area any kind of this flash floods or any kind of the tsunami effect can have a direct impact into the socio economic living conditions so what we want is that once you start building a cleaner greener eco space system surround your city with more trees with more shrubs with more forestry area automatically that can serve as a barricade and arrest the water coming inside so that is why we say that tsunami forests are also one of the preventive methods of having getting into the structural mitigation now moving forward we want to talk about this non structural mitigation or measures all together now we have to create early warnings education has to be given and proper training in school environment information and communication services let's talk about this topic in depth why because non structural is quite complicated for us to understand early warnings now most of the times people do not spend their factor or their quality time in terms of understanding the weather signals or weather reports we hardly look into our mobile phones talking about any weather report or weather forecast because that is just a part of our flash screen altogether but then what has been happening today is that most of the weather reporting firms or the organizations have started creating apps through which they can go and reach the people tell them clearly that what are the kind of warnings that you will be expecting coming in future why because people want them to get trained get them equipped with this factor that yes there are chances where the city is prone to disaster now let me tell you a very simple thing even before we step into the disaster 
I would like to talk about the traffic management system that has been happening across all the major cities of India, whether you take Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Gurgaon, Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata or any of these places. What has been happening altogether is that the space within the city, the movable space within the city has always been completely jammed. So we are not able to move out so freely. We have suddenly started feeling that there is always traffic jam. People have to reach their office in time and people start finding out ways to squeeze out of the traffic. Now what has happened with Google Maps coming into picture? It has started giving us the early warning saying that where there is going to be a traffic jam and which road is will be an alternative for you so that you can save your time. So what we mean by that early warnings is that we are trying to provide you measures or alternative pathways through which you will be able to mitigate the risk. Now this mitigation itself in non-structural format is more from an intellectual perspective, more from a decision perspective rather than just looking at it from a structural standpoint. Why? Because today when we talk about traffic or we talk about pollution or we talk about uh, you know water pollution, noise pollution or waste management, all these kind of things, these are all the warnings which we have already received from the nature. These are all the experiences that we have already undergone in our life. But it becomes very difficult for people to accept the truth and take it forward and again come back and start looking in for options. So this is why it is very, very important when I talk about the non-structural part, we need people to understand the early warnings so that we don't go regret, repent ourselves and then come back and say that this should have been done some years back or this should have been gone some days back. So we don't want that things to happen at any point of time. Secondly, education and giving proper training in school and in the, you know, I would say that the earlier walks of life in the school environment altogether. Now, in our education, the modern education system, what has been really emphasized or what has been really pushed upon onto most of the kids here is that it's only the theoretical subjects. We study about different subjects like English, social science, Max or science or history, all those kind of subjects. But then what are those practical subjects that can make them a better citizen? What are those subjects that can make them understand the scenario that is happening around them. Today, if a kid wants to go out and play, will he be able to play safe? Will he be a part subjected to pollution? Will he be subjected to any kind of risk? Will he be subjected to any kind of disaster? Now, these are all questions we don't think at that instance because we don't think that anything is going to happen at a sudden. But when it happens, we don't have a situation, we don't have an answer to come back and say that why we were not prepared. So that is why education today has to start concentrating at the school level where we need to ta start teaching the kids about environmental impacts, disaster, what it is, how is it, how you need to prevent yourself, what are the basic steps with which you can overcome the scenario altogether. Because many a times what we feel is that kids are today being subjected to high-end technology. Kids are being subjected to high-end knowledge, but they are not being subjected to practical living conditions. Everything seems to them to be like an automated system. You just press the button and things are coming across your screen. You just press the button, you see that some other activities are happening around you. But then when you step out of the house, what are the factors that can really put your life under threat? How do you manage that scenario? Because every time parents are not going to be around, the child will have to face certain scenarios, certain situations by itself. So in that case, what are you going to do? So it is a primary responsibility of the schools, colleges and every educational institution that we make disaster management not just a chapter or unit in a textbook, but make them understand practically the challenges of the country so that they get equipped 
they are ready to face the life at any given point of time. Followed by, I would also like to talk about the information and communication services. Now, if you look at information and communication, two different aspects. One side, all of us know that there is a whole lot of information by which we are surrounded. You just switch on your mobile phone, starting from your social media apps to that of business news app or the regular news that are happening around you. You are surrounded by information. You might probably talk about cricket, you might probably talk about politics or you might talk about some religion, some events, whatever that is happening around you, that's because of the information that is popping right across your screen. So there are several social media apps that are letting you know minute by minute, second by second what is happening. So now what is happening for the people is that if you start analyzing that they are flooded with information, they really do not know which information to absorb and which information to reject. So you are being just carried away by the sea of flow of information that is just coming across you. But then when we talk about communication, we don't communicate these days. We are only becoming silent observers of information. We don't want to share the information. We don't want to share the knowledge that is present with us because we feel that information what we have received, is it correct? Can it be shared? Is it sensitive? Is it non-sensitive? Could that be taken as the final value? So what I would like to say here in a non-structural approach is that every information and communication need to be valued, need to be evaluated before we start spreading it across. So you need to know that what is actually happening, what is the real scenario under which we are going through. Now, if there is going to be an event that is happening or if there is going to be some festivals that are happening around you, you need to know what are the things that are associated with it. Now, normally when you listen through the news channel or when you go through some entertainment channel, you know what is happening at the background. You sense information before you. The same thing also needs to be applied here. We need to sense the value of information that is associated with a disaster management level. You cannot take things lightly there. So that is why the information has to be packed. It has to be enriched with the values in such a manner that when it starts going towards people, when it starts approaching the people, they take it seriously. They take it in a sense where they get themselves prepared and then they are ready to understand and approach this scenario altogether. Now, moving forward. With this, we come to the end of the session. I hope and believe that the session was highly interesting, useful and informative. In the coming sessions, we will be talking more about the disaster management cycles and the effects in which how we can reduce disaster. Until then, stay tuned, stay blessed and stay enlightened forever. Thank you once again for joining me today.